Welcome to the Sloth Investor Podcast with your host, Mr. Sloth. The information on this podcast is provided for education and informational purposes only. The information contained in or provided from or through this podcast is not intended to be and does not constitute advice of any kind. Welcome everyone to episode 16 of the Sloth Investor Podcast, an investing podcast that explores why I believe the humble sloth is the best animal to characterize successful investing. Once again, I'm joined by my fellow sloth investor and co-host Jay. Jay, how are you? I'm doing fabulous. And for the regular listeners, you probably know that I'm a fan of the Edmonton Oilers ice hockey team. And I have to say, well, I'm thrilled with their current um, level of play and their current record. I'm a little bit um, dismayed because I bet some of my friends who might be listeners to this um, podcast that the Edmonton Oilers would finish higher than the Toronto Maple Leafs at the season's end, and we bet a friendly dinner on it. And at the beginning of the season, the Oilers were flying high, and the Toronto Maple Leafs were down in the dumps, and I had all these big, miraculous steak dinners planned with them, and I was sending them menus of all the things I was going to order. And unfortunately, the Toronto Maple Leafs have pretty much caught up to my hockey team. And so it's going to be neck and neck, which a uh, race, which I thought was going to be, uh, I, I was going to be the clear cut winner. Wow. Wow. And listeners, we are recording this episode on December the 1st, due to be released on December the 3rd. And it's December the 1st. And listeners, I need to say, Jay, you're wearing a festive themed Jump in terms of the color, nice and red. I can't, you know what? Right. Soon, I've been taught as soon as uh, the American Thanksgiving happens, then you can um, begin to um, become festive and decorate for the Christmas holiday season. I love it. I love it. That festive theme color, bright red. I like it. And my office space, you might have noticed when you walked in, there's a Christmas decoration set up all around. I love it. Getting into the festive spirit. Indeed, indeed, indeed. We have our Christmas tree too. Oh. <sighs> Kicking off the holiday season style. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So talk to us about what's, what's today's episode about. Yeah. So this is the second episode of the Sloth Investor Podcast that we're devoting to an investing book. Okay. So in episode 12, we discussed Richer, Wiser, Happier by William Green, of course. Okay. So in today's episode, episode 16, we're turning our attention to a book by Morgan Housel, and it's entitled The Psychology of Money. Morgan is quite simply my favorite investment writer. I've already mentioned him on several occasions during our podcast series. And this book, which I read several months ago, is without doubt one of my favorite investment books. I also read an amazing stat online, which informed me that the book has now sold over 1 million copies. 1 million copies, that, that is a crazy, crazy number, a million copies. It, it blew me away. It's just incredible. So, you know, so I think it's safe to say that the book we're discussing today has been very well received. What do you think a million copies, before you go into in-depth in it, if you had to try and hit the nail on the head and, and tell us why it sold a million copies, it, I haven't read the book myself, mm. but if you were to sort of give us your um, synopsis of it, why, what, what would be the reason for it selling a million copies? Mm, that's a great question, Jay. So mm, for me, one of the key reasons is quite simply the readability factor. A chief reason why I've been a fan of Hauser's writing for some time now and why I believe this book has sold so well is because of how clearly he writes. He possesses that enviable gift of being able to convert complex concepts into easily digestible pearls of investing wisdom. He used to work for the Motley Fool as a writer, and the quality of his writing output there was also astonishing. I'd love to, at some point in the future, devote an entire episode to some of my favorite articles that he wrote while working at the Motley Fool. I have to say, the Motley Fool, one of the things I really like about them is they make their information accessible. Ah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a yeah. subscriber to Motley Fool. Yeah. Um, I, I really like what they have to say, but what most importantly, I like how it's, it doesn't talk over my head. It talks to me like I'm, I'm an average Joe, and mm. I, I like that accessibility of it. Yeah, jargon-free. That's one thing I would say as well. I agree with you completely. Um, so I mentioned one article titled Tyranny of the Calendar during episode four, in which we explore time, my fourth bedrock principle. For now, though, I think it's about time that we started to explore my key takeaways from the psychology of money. So I think a useful format will be to preface each takeaway with a quote from the book that links to that particular thematic takeaway. Now, you're keen to talk about what the author has to say on wealth being hidden. 
Tell me more about that. Wealth being hidden. What does that mean? Mm, sure, Dre. Thanks. So I'll read a quote from chapter nine that is entitled, Wealth is what you don't see. Okay. Wealth is what you don't see. Okay. So begin quote. Money has many ironies. Here's an important one. Wealth is what you don't see. We tend to judge wealth by what we see because that's the information we have in front of us. We can't see people's bank accounts or brokerage statements. So we rely on outward appearances to gauge financial success. Cars, homes, Instagram photos. Modern capitalism makes helping people fake it until they make it a cherished industry. But the truth is that wealth is what you don't see. Wealth is the nice car not purchased, the diamonds not bought, the watches not worn, the clothes foregone, and the first class upgrade declined. End quote. Okay, so some great words here from Morgan Housel. For me, what immediately comes to mind is the concept of opportunity cost. Clearly, there's an opportunity cost to major spending decisions. For me, the line, nice cars not purchased, really resonates. It makes me think back to the time that my wife and I lived in the Middle East. It appeared to be the custom for many expatriates there to buy a large, spacious car soon after arriving in the region. The reasons for this were varied. For example, there was certainly a concern from some expatriates about safety in the roads. But it was also the case that with plenty of disposable income via generous salaries, many expatriates couldn't help but indulge in a large but costly motor vehicle. Mrs. Sloth and I took a different approach, though, recognizing the opportunity cost of spending a vast amount of money on a brand new car. We simply bought a second-hand car, and that worked for us like a treat. In essence, we felt no need to keep up with the Joneses. Okay, back to that quote for a second. Wealth is what you don't see. Those six words are really powerful in my opinion. Jay, Jay, what are your thoughts? Well, and I keep in mind, I haven't lived in Canada for 20 years, but growing up, flaunting your wealth was a very un-Canadian thing to do. Mm. Um, if you were um, the owner of a big construction company, you may have um, been incredibly wealthy but if you showed up to the work site, the job site, driving a Mercedes or a BMW or nowadays a Tesla, um, then you were front, it was very much frowned upon. That's not the kind of thing that you did. You never flaunted your wealth. You sort of um, kept it um, to yourself in many regards. That's a very Canadian thing to do. And I think Andrew Hellum, um, a Canadian author, which you speak about, probably speaks to that, the importance of and the value of actually um, not upgrading yourself to the business class ticket or or regularly going out and spending lavishly on a meal with uh, with your friends, mm. that there's a lot of value um, to be understood in not doing that. Mm. Really interesting, isn't it? Really, really interesting indeed. Okay, I think I, I think about, you know, two words being of hatred. I think about hubris and I think about humility, okay? And just that um, ability to be humble and to think about, you know, with my spending decisions, do I really need this flashy watch? Do I need, really need those brand designer clothes? Just makes me really think um, in particular about what Housel has to say in that respect. So yeah, definitely, definitely very interesting idea. That It's very funny because yeah. my son and I are very... Uh, we have clothes that may be like five, 10 years old and it drives my wife nuts. Mm. She's like, why don't you get a new shirt? Like this, this sweatshirt works perfectly fine. I am do, I am not getting a new shirt. No, we need to get you a new one that looks old and tattered. Like it does the trick. Yeah. And my son, it comes that he's cut from the same cloth. He's like, no, I don't want anything new. I don't need anything new. This does exactly what I needed to do. And I'm okay with this. I like it. I'm, I'm similar. If the clothes are functional, if it fits me well, you know, I'm quite similar as well. If the clothes are working fine for me, then no need to throw it out. Perfectly fine for me. Absolutely. I'm, I'm wearing those clothes until the moths are flying out of it. Absolutely, Jay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I like to move on now to what Morgan Housel has to say about volatility. And I guess it's quite topical at the moment with what's going on. And we'll touch upon that in a moment, I think. But let me now share a quote from chapter 15 of the book. Okay. Begin quote. Market returns are never free and never will be. They demand you pay a price like any other product. The volatility uncertainty fee, the price of returns, is the cost of admission to get returns greater than low fee perks like cash and bonds. The trick is convincing yourself that the market's fee is worth it. That's the only way to properly deal with volatility and uncertainty. 
not just putting up with it, but realizing that it's an admission fee worth paying, end quote. That whole concept of an admission fee worth paying, that really, really resonates with me. Jay, what are your thoughts on volatility being the price of admission to the stock market? Okay, as someone who's been around the block a couple of times and made the mistake of, um, it seems like a very volatile time. I better sell off and wait for a better time to get back in the market. I've learned some hard lessons. And um, I have to admit that I was um, of that similar mind uh, when the coronavirus, COVID first mm. struck. I sold a couple of uh, some stocks, which I felt um, might take a hit. And they've come back in a big way. And it, it's ultimately resulted in, in sort of lost potential income there. Yeah. And the Om- Omicron, am I saying it right? Yeah, I believe so. Omicron. Omicron yeah. There's yeah. a current sell-off right now yeah. because of the w- the worries and the fears around Omicron. Mm. And if I could, one thing I've learned is that I'm not touching anything. I'm just yeah. keeping everything as is. It looks like things are taking a bit of a nosedive right now. It's December 1st. And um, there are some stocks that are taking a big hit because of the uncertainty around that. But from my own takeaway is from my lessons I've learned, the hard lessons I've learned is don't touch it. Let it go mm. um, and just continue to stay headstrong with mm. what I think is a good company. Mm. I love that. I love the fact that you've made reference as well to the fifth bedrock principle of the stock investor being headstrong. I mean, you know, it could well be in two weeks' time. Prices could be plummeting. In two months' time, prices could be plummeting. But I'm of the opinion that in two decades, this would appear like a relative blip on the stock chart. Okay, I think it really will. So I think it's just about remaining headstrong and just taking a look at market history and just reflecting upon these past events, events we spoke about before, those geopolitical events, and just recognizing that, yeah, volatility is the price of admission to the stock market, but it's the price you pay for those superior returns compared to things such as cash in a savings account or perhaps bonds. So it is the price of admission to the stock market. And Absolutely. Warren Buffett, you talked about this last week, yeah. Warren, or sorry, last episode. Yeah, yeah. Warren Buffett talks about, you know, the ability to ignore the noise. Yeah. You know, the, the, all these things over time are just going to be small, tiny little blips. When you expand this over a 10, 20 year period, these are just small little blips, um, which seem very big and important right now. In the long term, they're nothing. Sure. It's all about perspective. Absolutely. Thanks, Jay. So, um, you know, I'm going to share a quote now that makes me feel a little bit annoyed. And it's not because it's not a great quote. It certainly is a great quote. It's more because it's a quote that I wish I had used during episode 11, which was the episode in which we answered the simple question, why invest? Okay, so I'll share the quote now, and hopefully then our listeners will realize why it would have fit so snugly into that particular episode. Begin quote. Controlling your time is the highest dividend money pays. The highest form of wealth is the ability to wake up every morning and say, I do whatever I want today. More than your salary, more than the size of your house, more than the prestige of your job, control over doing what you want, when you want to, with the people you want to, is the broadest lifestyle variable that makes people happy. Money's greatest intrinsic value, and this can't be overstated, is its ability to give you control over your time. End quote. I love that. Though certainly not easy, the undeniable fact is that investing can enable you to take back control of your time. Jay, what do you think about this? Well, as someone who's, um, and we were talking this about this before the episode, how right now time seems to be at a premium and, and the associated stress about how I feel like right now I'm uh, running around with a, a chicken with its head cut off and I want to still continue to invest. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm continuing with my regular investments in an ETF so I don't have to think about it because I don't have time to do um, due diligence in a lot of mm. companies. So I'm just doing it in an ETF. And you know what, uh, to help me feel more secure, especially with the in- instability right now, little and often, mm. just do a little bit and just do it regularly. Mm. And, and that to me is peace of mind. I can back off, but also my hope is in the long term, while this might be a stressful um, period in my life, that these investments will pay off and giving me greater time as I grow older. And one of the big things I'm looking forward to down the road is being a granddad and having the freedom to, and the ability to spend time with my grandkids because I have that, um, I've done some proper planning yeah. with my investments. My investment strategy has paid off. Absolutely. And I'd like to echo those same four swords. So that's a key reason why I invest. I would love to perhaps not work to that conventional retirement age that many people do around the world and retire a little bit earlier. 
that would be great to do. So yeah, those long-term goals are what we have in sight. Absolutely, Jim. Um, so I'd like to share a quote now that really, really lies at the heart of the book, okay? And that's because it centers upon the importance of psychology. So as we've mentioned on many occasions before, within this podcast series, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to be an effective investor, but you do need the ability to think calmly and rationally, essentially to show an even temperament. And that's something, again, that we touched upon on our previous episode, episode 15. Okay, and this is what Morgan Housel has to say in this regard. Begin quote. The premise of this book is that doing well with money has a little to do with how smart you are and a lot to do with how you behave. And behavior is hard to teach, even to really smart people. A genius who loses control of their emotions can be a financial disaster. The opposite is also true. Ordinary folks with no financial education can be wealthy if they have a handful of behavioral skills that have nothing to do with formal measures of intelligence. Housel then goes on to state, we think about and are taught about money in ways that are too much like physics with rules and laws and not enough like psychology with emotions and nuance, end quote. Jay, what are your thoughts about this? Well, that it's a, this is such an important aspect of financial literacy. You not only have to be able to um, balance the numbers and look at the numbers and crunch numbers and um, have projections, but discipline. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's a behavioral science in many regards in that you have to understand that you, if you, you can criti- critically look at your own behaviors if you understand what's, what, it, what is a natural behavior. And, and when there's a big sell-off, that's mm-hmm. a natural behavior to be nervous. Mm-hmm. Um but one of the, again, one of the things that I've had to learn some hard lessons and even the last couple of years, I consider myself a much more seasoned investor. And even a couple of years ago, I was like, ooh, this, uh, the, the coronavirus, the COVID is going to hit the world hard. I'm selling off um, some of my stocks just to hold some more money in cash. Mm. And I sold at a lower point and mm. stocks did go a bit lower than they ran back up over the next uh, couple of years. And I didn't get back in. Um because of the uncertainty, and had I just stayed strong, headstrong, mm. I would have been further ahead of the yeah. game than I am now. And Jay, of course, we're fortunate in, in, by the fact that you know we are we are both sloth investors, and naturally, we know that sloths are half blind and half deaf. Now, because of the fact that the uh, Omicron, am I saying that right, Jay? Uh, Omicron, 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 the Omicron virus. You know, we we've heard a lot about it in the media. We you know this very day and days before. You and I, because we're sloth investors, we're not so perturbed by that because obviously being sloths, mm. we're half blind, half deaf. So naturally, we're able to tune out the noise. So that's one of the qualities of being a sloth investor that you can tune out the noise in terms of the fact that, you know, you're half blind, half deaf, and we can just get on with our, our daily business and, you know, interact with our families and so on. All right. If you listen to the, uh, listen to since like uh, news, um, financial news yeah. right now there's a, you know, the sensationalism yeah. around it is, yeah. is it's, if you're not attuned to it, then you're going to be susceptible to it. Absolutely. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, I've mentioned that phrase in previous episodes, the hysteria and the hyperbole of the financial media, you know, they're out to get the viewing figures, but fundamentally you need to think about, is it in your best interest to sell, to make that quick decision that, perhaps isn't in your in your best interest. So yeah, worth considering, that's for sure. Okay, so Jay, to build on this discussion about investor psychology, I'd like to share this quote from Warren Buffett, the subject, of course, of our previous podcast. And this is what Buffett has to say on the importance of temperament. Begin quote. Success in investing doesn't correlate with IQ once you're above the level of 125. Once you have ordinary intelligence, what you need is the temperament to control the urges that get other people into trouble in investing, end quote. I love that. And Jay, you know, when we think about some of the most successful, most effective investors that we've mentioned on this podcast series so far, individuals such as Andrew Hallam, Grace Groner, heck, even my father-in-law, they would be the first to admit that they are not geniuses, but yet they possess one of the key ingredients necessary to be an effective investor. And that is the ability to think in a calm, rational manner to display a finely balanced temperament. I also love the fact that the individual that taught Andrew Hallam 
or for the millionaire teacher about how to invest was a mechanic. In fact, it was a millionaire mechanic, which I think just further strengthens the argument of Buffett, Housel and ourselves when we state that you do not need to be a genius to be a successful investor. And quite frankly, that's something we should all be grateful for. Okay, Jay, are you ready for our final book quote? Yeah, and I am, but I just want to say, I want to point out that some of the, the best lessons I've learned in investment actually have not come from investment professionals, but rather um, teachers. Yeah. The irony of that. Yeah. I, you know, you talk about Andrew Hellam, some of the best investment that he got, best, best investment advice he got that really resonated with him and changed his life was from a mechanic. Yeah. And for me, I would say it's coming from teachers. You yeah. know, previously, before I sort of, started down this journey of I'm um, taking control of my own investment strategy. I was listening to fi- quote unquote financial professionals, people from the banks, um, people from investment companies. And um, it brought me a lot of heartache. Yeah. And the, it's I- ironic, you know, yourself and, and my friend, Steve, and my friend Ward, um, Andrew Hellum, these are all people in education that actually have been giving me some really sound, smart advice about investment strategies that have proved to be really fruitful. Mm. And I know, I think in a previous episode, we briefly touched upon that as well. And we did begin to speculate about why would it be, why would it be that teachers are, you know, it seemed to be a group of people that have the ability to invest well, have investing wisdom. And I just wonder, again, when we think about the educational profession, we see our students take that journey on an incremental basis, day by day, yeah. week upon week. And we begin to see that, you know, success isn't achieved overnight, but it's that gradual process. Okay, I'm thinking again about compound interest. So I just wonder, you know, could that have something to do with it? We, as, as professionals, we recognize as teachers that, you know, it does take time for success to be achieved. But if you've got the patience, then you do see those productive results eventually achieve. I don't know. Yeah, don't education's know. a long-term journey. It's not, a, it's not a, a short-term one week, one month, uh, even one year yeah. journey. So maybe that there's something in that. Yeah, the long-term journey, that's for sure. Um, okay, so Jay, I know that we have many parents that listen to this podcast and we also have many prospective parents perhaps. So my final quote from the Psychology of Money is what Morgan Housel, the author, wrote to his own son shortly after he was born. And it's a great quote. I love it. Here it is. Begin quote. Some people are born into families that encourage education. Others are against it. Some are born into flourishing economies, encouraging of entrepreneurship. Others are born into war and destitution. I want you to be successful and I want you to earn it. But realize that not all success is due to hard work. And not all poverty is due to laziness. Keep this in mind when judging people, including yourself. End quote. Extremely powerful words there, in my opinion, Jay. What are your thoughts on these words of wisdom from Housel to his son? Well, and you know what? The, the, when I when I was talking with you before the episode, and I couldn't help but um, relate this as a, as a dad myself and as an educator, um, the words of Bruce Lee. And he says, instead of buying your children, all the things you never had, you should teach them all the things you were never taught. Material wears out, but knowledge stays. And oh. that, to me, that's that's what I'm trying to do with my own children. I love that. I love that so much, Jay. I love that. I really do. And can I touch upon something that's on your shirt? Please. Like, so oh. Jay's, you know, like I mentioned before, he's wearing a Yuletide <laughs> themed shirt, you know, festive in color, bright red. I love it. And on Jay's shirt, are the words, I don't teach old school and i love that because i think about education in our day jay when you and i were at school would we have learned about financial literacy no no no. but i love the fact that in previous episodes we've spoken about the fact that you know gradually now around the world we're seeing financial literacy programs being introduced you mentioned one a couple episodes ago about ontario i think it was back a while ago and we're seeing more and more books written for young people and um i just hope I hope with these podcast episodes that we can see more and more people learning how to invest in a sloth-like manner using common sense, rationality. And I just love what's on your show. I don't teach old school. Okay, so we're thinking about what did a younger generation need? Forget the hyperbole and hysteria of the financial media, just common sense, rational thinking. So it's a, a great way to wrap up the episode, I think. Absolutely. All right, everybody, that's it for today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and have a couple of pearls of wisdom to take away from you. Uh, we wish you all a happy start to your December month. Indeed. Bye for now.
For more tips, follow the Sloth Investor on Twitter at Sloth underscore Investor.